The Airbus A400M has become the mainstay of Europe's air forces since it entered service in 2013. The aircraft sits in its own niche, smaller than the C-17 Globemaster, but with twice the capacity of the C-130 Hercules, which it often replaces. It's also powered by four TP400 turboprop engines, the most powerful turboprop engine ever built. But how do Airbus actually build these airplanes? We took a trip to the Airbus final assembly line in Seville to find out. Let me introduce you to the best PPE in the business. It wouldn't be a visit to a final assembly line without some ridiculous clothes. So first of all, we have the classic high vis jacket. We also have the FOD bag. This is where we put any loose articles to stop them getting stuck anywhere in airplanes that are being built or anywhere around the factory. We also have the hat, absolute stylish accessory, essential to avoid head injuries. And of course, the shoes. The facility here in Seville is one of many Airbus final assembly lines across Europe, but one of only two that handles projects for Airbus Defence and Space. That's the A400M and C295 here, and the A330 MRTT over in Madrid. Click on our link in the video description to check out our video all about the MRTT. So here's how the assembly works. Firstly, component parts of the aircraft arrive by Beluga from Airbus facilities all across Europe. Check out the other link in the description to see our video about the Beluga. As with all Airbus aircraft, different facilities around the continent produce the component parts that are assembled here in Seville. The parts then essentially make their way around the facility in a kind of zigzag pattern to a series of 72 stations where the different parts are assembled. Now, I won't go through all 72 of them, but here are some of the most important ones. So the team were just explaining how they have to select people very carefully to work inside the wings when they're assembling them. And guess what the main criteria is? It's being small. So I'm going to have a quick look. The very first one, Station 72, is where the wing boxes are assembled and tested. They also install key systems here like bleed air, which taps high energy air from the engines for various uses around the aircraft. Moving on, Station 60 is where the fuselage sections are joined up. The precision required at every stage here is incredible, and the team here have just a 2mm tolerance when joining the pieces of the fuselage. Here we can see the first A400M destined for Indonesia. Fun fact, over 3,220 rivets are included in the construction of this stage. Station 50 is where the empennage is joined up, that's the aircraft's tail section. The A400M features a T-tail design that sits 14.7 metres above the ground and provides maximum ground clearance. That's a common design in military aircraft like this, so think of the C-17 and the C-5, they also have T-tails. Station 40 is where it all really starts to come together. This is the full integration stage. They start by combining the wings, fuselage, tail fin and landing gear. So one of the things I find most interesting about this aircraft is the undercarriage. Now, the main undercarriage on the A400 has 12 wheels. That's a lot more than most other aircraft like this have. And there are two reasons for that. First of all, 12 wheels means 12 carbon disc brakes. That means the aircraft is gonna stop faster and has just generally better short field performance. The other reason is the spreading of the load. Now, this aircraft can take quite a high capacity load and put that load onto an unprepared surface. Now, if you land a heavy aircraft on an unprepared surface, you want as many wheels as possible, spread as widely as possible to protect that surface. That means A, you can land on the surface and B, you can take off from it again once you're done. Integration is mostly a digitized process, but some things are still handled manually. Take a look at this enormous black table. This is used to manually measure and cut a giant seal that seals the gaps between the wings and the fuselage. Finally, the four mighty TP400 engines are installed, the aircraft is furnished, and that's it, you now have a new A400M. Now, the completed aircraft finally heads outside to stage 30, and that's an engine running area, which in Seville is designated as Tango. But another fun fact, at the Airbus final assembly line in Toulouse, this area is nicknamed Bikini because it's always so hot out there. 
a lot of systems are tested out here, and we got to witness one or two of those tests. Firstly was the test of the Ram Air Turbine. That's a small propeller that deploys into the airflow to provide electrical power to key systems in an emergency. Next up, I got to test the opening system on this aircraft's enormous cargo door. Now, they told me I was the first person to open this aircraft's door outside the factory. I think they might have just been trying to make me feel important. Nevertheless, it worked. I felt important and the door opened. Okay, so we've had an extra surprise. Thanks to the very kind team at Airbus, we are going to fly on this A400M. This particular A400 is destined for the German Air Force and we're gonna be flying on its second ever flight. And what we're gonna be doing more importantly is opening and closing this door right here and simulating some load drops out the back. Now there are two kind of drops we're gonna be simulating, one of which involves essentially a large pallet that would contain one vehicle and the other that uses a smaller fixed size pallets which could contain things like humanitarian supplies and we're going to watch the crew and how they interact with each other throughout that process. Check. V1. Update. Let's go. Uh, climb. Stand by, stand by, stand by for the noise. Okay. The noise is recorded? Yes. Okay, get up. Now, of course, it goes without saying that the view from inside of a plane with no windows isn't always the most interesting, but you can really feel the A400 as it throws itself into the air. Today's flight takes us from Seville to Moron Air Base and back. The crew will be using this flight to run final checks on the aircraft's capabilities before its delivery to the German Air Force. The crew are testing two different delivery methods today, the container delivery system and the gravity x -locks. The container delivery system, or CDS, involves a mechanical delivery of containers that could hold anything from medical supplies to vehicles. The gravity drop is quite literally unlocking the cargo and letting Mother Nature do the rest. We're only simulating those today, so no real cargo is going to be moving around, but we still get to see some great views out the back of the aircraft. We're also going to see the gravity drop scenario simulated on the ground. All of the airborne drops are simulated at an altitude of 2,000 feet and an airspeed of 130 knots. The container delivery system utilizes a series of electronic release gates that run down the fuselage of the aircraft. The loadmaster enters all the drop details into a mission planning system prior to takeoff, and that feeds directly into the FMS, the flight management system, in the flight deck. The cockpit crew are constantly communicating both verbally and through light signals with the loadmaster to coordinate a countdown, and that starts four minutes prior to the door opening and the drop. Here's what a simulated offload on an unpaved runway looks like. Now put quite simply, this involves opening the door, throttling up with the brakes on, and then releasing the brakes. So I'm here with Nacho, he's the chief test pilot for both the A400M and the Airbus MRTT programs. So Nacho, tell me a little bit about your background and how you, how you got to this position and the kind of types you've flown to get here. So I'm a former Spanish military pilot, a combat uh, the Spanish Air Force. I started flying the Fives and then the Mirage. In 2003, I did the uh, union with Airbus, so I was uh, hired with Airbus. Previous to that, I was the pilot uh, in the Spanish Air Force from 97, and in a way I have flown initially fighters. When I start in the in the testing in, in the Air Force, I start to fly everything coming to my hands. And in a way, in Airbus, I, I fly Eurofighter, MRTT, A400M, and the medium allies, the Casa 295. Tell me about flying the A400. What's it like compared to other larger aircraft you've flown? So the, the A400M is really a versatile aircraft, so it has a lot of capabilities and in a way can do a lot of missions. In the flying, it is very easy and very smooth. So we have developed the flight controls of the aircraft to allow a crew of two to be able to not focusing the flying a lot, but focusing in managing all the systems. It is a, an aircraft of a size of an Airbus 300, but with the muscles of an Airbus 340. So the surfaces are so big that we are able to have kind of beat rate, roll rate, high Gs that uh, make me feel like if I am in a heavy fighter, let's say. So we start to develop the flight guidance and the automatisms similar to what we have in a commercial aircraft. Uh, so to going from A to B pretty much in, in automatic. And then we have developed further to start to do more missions so we can do in automatic aerial delivery and then, as you have said, when we merge a terrain database with a good navigation system with the military GPS and the automatisms that we have in the flight guidance, we can do low-level flying automatic up to 500 feet uh, by 
night or in the clouds uh, with a very supportive system that it is completely autonomous or without any radiation outside the aircraft. Brilliant. And I think one of the things I learned today about the A400M, which I didn't know before, was that it has air-to-air -air refueling capability, not just to receive, but to actually refuel other aircraft. And not something we really see in turboprop aircraft very, very often. Um, and I understand that the aircraft is capable of refueling helicopters. So how does that work logistically, you know, to fly slow enough and stable enough to, to refuel something as slow as a helicopter? So the aircraft has the capability to, to have three points of uh, air to air refueling, two in the wings and one in the fuselage. And we start to develop the system for fighters mainly to support in a tactical operations. As well, the 410 himself, it is a receiver. So we have developed the flight controls to be able to receive well in order to have very, very long range and be really strategic in a deployment of, of high payload. And the last step that we did, it is we managed to adapt the aircraft and the system for actual refueling to helicopters, doing a longer hoses, because we had some problems with the stability of the hose and the interaction in the weight turbulence on the helicopter and the loads in the blades. And at the end, we have a very long hose, 120 feet, with an adapted a basket as well. And the aircraft is amazing. We have to fly very slow speed to cope with the speeds of the helicopters. And we are able to fly at speeds of 105 knots, that for such a large aircraft is really impressive. And is that quite a high angle of attack? then if you're so flying at that Definitely speed. we have different setting of flaps that, that adapt as well the angle of attack, but really we are in the lowest speeds that we are in a way with uh, uh, enough margin with the stalls to be protected that the uh, operators can manage the operation without being worried to, to go close to, to the lowest speed. But really it's impressive, 1,005 uh, knots is something important. So you have that stability in low speed, but the other thing I noticed about the A400M is that it has sweat wicks, which is quite unusual for a turboprop and you know what what's the point in that is that just so we can go faster so the the maximum speed operational speed uh, of the aircraft is 300 knots or in altitude uh, 72 mach which is uh, really close to the speeds that the light liners with this kind of, of wind are cruising and in a way uh, that allow us to have this strategic capability that I told you before. So we can reach a very far area where we need maybe to, to provide humanitarian aid, but very fast at these speeds allow us this, this capability that makes that we can go faster than the rotation time it is as well faster, the, the fatigue on the cruise is lower, so in a way that provides a lot of capability to our users, to our customers to make this kind of mission very fast and very far. And I think that's probably the most interesting thing I've learned today that just the fact that the aircraft, this type of aircraft doing this type of mission is flying that bit faster and that means the crews are working less time and are less fatigued and they can be more focused on the mission. Nacho, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much. So Gert, you are the head of the A400M program. What does that actually entail? What do you do? It means to be in charge for uh, being the interface uh, with our customer, uh, for making sure that uh, at the end we deliver uh, an aircraft. So it's kind of an end-to-end -end responsibility inside Airbus for the A400M. Great. And if we were to compare your role to, say, someone who is the head of a commercial uh, aircraft program role, such as, say, the A321, which we're very familiar with right now, are your jobs any different? Well, it is different from the perspective that we work with an institutional customer, for sure. So our customer of the nation is not a commercial business. And yes, there are differences in that. But at the end of the day, there is a lot in common. We have a customer. We have a fantastic aircraft. We need to make sure that we fulfill the needs of our customer to have a uh, happy operator at the end of the day. In the basics, it's rather the same. And I'm interested when we look at the final assembly lines for commercial aircraft, you know, there are a lot of aeroplanes in there and they are constantly going through, particularly when we, uh, we looked at the A330 sort of assembly line recently and, and there were a lot of aeroplanes there all ready to go to customers, you know, lots of tails with different people on them. How does that kind of supply and demand work with military aircraft? Because presumably you have less aircraft going through at any one time. So how many do you have kind of on the assembly line at once or being refitted? Well, we are talking of totally different rates there and I uh, uh, was in charge for the global operations of the A320 family before, so that's where basically we we talk about delivering and producing uh, two aircrafts uh, per workday. That's not the same on the military business. We are producing the A400M at a rate eight per year. A fundamental difference. Big difference. Yeah, a big difference. I mean, it's a different user market at the end of the day. We will never end up uh, with uh, commercial rates in the military business. That's rather clear. Also, it's uh, 
different process for the nations to decide what is the demand of aircraft for mm. the future. The commercial is very business. As long as the airlines can sell tickets, they, they will go. Uh, and we see there is a, back, a big backlog still to, to fulfill, which is great. That's good. And you mentioned there the, the different nations that purchase the aircraft. Presumably they all have slightly different needs, because as, as we've learned, there's so much the aircraft can do. Can you give me an example of some of the nations that have, have purchased the aircraft and how they differently configuring them when they get them delivered? In terms of basic configuration, it is rather similar, rather similar because the basic A400M already covers the widest range of capabilities that we have shown you today. So from that perspective, that's uh, pretty much the same for everyone. We have nations um, that dedicate their aircraft more to pure strategic missions or transportation of goods. Others focus only on tactical missions there. Huh? So there is different in how the platform is used. Then also um, we have customized solution when it comes uh, to communication, to cryptography, uh, to the self-defense system of the platform. Here there are uh, differences between, between the nations, but the basic platform already offers the majority of capabilities and that's the same for, for all the nations. And thinking about capabilities, I understand that you're looking to develop uh, air, aerial firefighting capability into the aircraft. Yes. How is that going to work? Well, that's basically another kit that we can put in the cargo hold of the aircraft. That means we don't need to modify the aircraft itself. Huh? Whenever we need it, we put it on the aircraft, there is no fire, we remove it from the aircraft and that goes in, uh, in rather short time. And that's a big benefit of this firefighter kit, it can do the job, but it, you don't need to buy an aircraft and have it parking for all the time when there is no fire. And so, in terms of cost, big uh, benefits there, but also in terms of capability, because you can fly the firefighter mission also in the night, which hardly any other firefighter aircraft can do. So here, the enormous capabilities that the aircraft is bringing already is helping a lot also for this firefighter mission. I see, so it's a very kind of modular kind yes. of upgrade, which, so I guess uh, the aircraft is like, the A400M is like the Thunderbird 2 of turboprops, yes. basically. Um, and just finally, I want to talk a bit about commonality. So um, Airbus has often led with that philosophy of commonality between aircraft types, we specific, we particularly see it with the, the airliners. Is there any commonality for, for pilots, say, that they would recognise in the cockpit of an A400M compared to any other Airbus commercial aircraft? So there is a lot of commonality there. The A400M cockpit is uh, largely uh, taken from uh, what we know from the A380. So there is, are not a lot of A380 pilots in the Air Forces, but there is uh, overall in the Airbus philosophy big commonality to the MRTT, for example, the 330, to the 320 that uh, many of our Air Forces also operate. So here the pilots will have uh, easy adaptation to the type rating uh, with fewer training effort and they are, will be very familiar with what they find. Huh? So who is flying whatever aircraft will have an easy adaptation to the A400M. And perhaps the other way around as well. So and when those guys way. leave exactly. the military, they can perhaps step into an A380 and it looks kind of familiar. Pretty similar, yes. Brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. What do you think of the A400M? It's certainly an impressive aircraft to see up close and it's even more impressive in the air. This is Chris Lomas for Flight Radar 24 in Seville.